Hello, so welcome back. Today we're going to learn how to make Pong in Scratch. If you haven't saved your work from yesterday, now's the time to do it because it'll get erased when we start a new file. So I'm going to walk you through every step and try to explain as much of it as I can while I go so that you have a better understanding of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it that way. And hopefully at the end, you'll have been able to create your first game and in the future, we'll try to make your own games. This video will be available to watch afterwards, so don't worry if you miss anything. If any part of my explanation wasn't clear, I'll be available on Discord afterwards. Write down your questions as you think of them, and you can ask me them later. Our goal is to get a completed and working game of Pong by the end of the week. So we'll open up Scratch again, and we'll save your old work first if you want to keep it. So to save your game, go to File, Save Now, or Save to your computer, and then make sure to save. And so now we're going to start with a new game. So now that we have a little bit of an idea of where everything in the program is, we're going to break down the game of Pong before we start. Before you start making any sort of video game, it's important to have a plan and to figure out everything you're going to need before you start. When you do this, you can generally estimate how much work something is going to take and figure out if you have enough time to do it. This is especially important in game jams when you have a limited amount of time to make something. In this case, Pong is already designed for us. So we just need to reverse engineer it by examining the game and figuring out how it's supposed to work. So what is Pong and how does it work? So Pong is a virtual game of table tennis. So to start, we're going to look at the different components that this game is going to need. We're going to need five different objects to make Pong. So first, we're going to have the player paddle. We're going to have the enemy paddle. There's the ball. We're going to have a player goal. And we're going to have an enemy goal. We're also going to need a background. And we're going to need two score counters. The player paddle can only move up and down vertically. And it stops at the very top and the bottom of the screen and the opponent paddle is the same. The ball always starts in the middle of the field and it moves in a random direction. It bounces off the top and bottom of the screen or it resets if it hits a goal on the left or the right. When a goal is hit, the score counter changes. If it hits the player goal, the opponent gets a point. If it hits the opponent goal, the player gets a point. The opponent paddle has its own artificial intelligence to try and bounce the ball back at you and it moves at a specific speed. And then finally, whoever gets 11 points first wins. So now that we've broken down all of the elements that we're going to need, we have an idea of how the Pong game is supposed to work and all the pieces we need to get working. So let's start on creating this game. So first, we're going to start with a background. So backgrounds are 480 pixels wide and 360 pixels tall in Scratch. Since our background's a boring white, we're going to change that first. I've created three image files to use with our game, Pong Background, Pong Ball, and Pong Paddle. You should have received these files before the camp started. So you'll find out where you saved them and upload them into the game. So today I'm going to use these pre-existing images to work with to create the game, but tomorrow I'm going to teach you how to make your own graphics to make the game more personal and more interesting. So at the bottom right of the screen, we're going to hover over the backdrop button to add a backdrop or the background. I'm going to scroll to upload 
and I'm going to choose Pong Background for our background. You'll want to find the folder you saved these images in and select them there. So now our game needs to know that when we start the game, we want this background to display. So I'm going to click on the Code tab, and I'm going to tell it how to do so. So let's go to Events. The first thing you'll see is the puzzle piece that tells the computer to start reading the code when the green flag is clicked. So I'm going to click, hold the button, and drag this into the code window. And so right now, if you click the green flag, nothing will happen because we haven't told the computer what to do. We want the computer to always show the space backdrop when it starts. This is important to know how to do in case you have multiple levels or multiple backgrounds. So first we're going to click on Looks. And we're going to tell it to switch the backdrop to Pong Background. Now when we click the flag, it doesn't look like it does anything, but if you have multiple backdrops, it will make sure that Pong Background is the background that shows up as soon as you play the game. It's important when adding code to tell the computer what to do, because it can't guess, and if there are multiple backgrounds, you need to know what background it's using at any given time. So if you think about this, this could mean different levels, or even the menu screen and credits, they could count as back different backdrops. So it's important to always know what is being shown at any given time. So now that we've got our background working, we can start working on our player paddle. So first we're going to deal with how it looks. So first I'm going to start by renaming this sprite to player paddle. The default sprite is a cat, so we're going to change the sprite for this as well. The sprite's look can be changed under the costumes tab. The first thing you'll notice is that there's two drawings instead of one for this character. And I don't need them, so I'm just going to delete the second one. Now I'm going to upload the image, Pong Paddle, by hovering over the Add Sprite button and choosing Upload. If you look on our game screen, the paddle's the right size. I'll show you a few ways you can adjust the way your image looks using X and Y coordinates, the size and direction. So again, you can change the size if it's too big, but I like the size that it currently is. And something you'll notice is that the player paddle is not in the correct spot. All of our images are centered at X0 and Y0, so we're going to have to change it manually. I need the player paddle to be on the left side of the screen, so I'm going to move it along the x-axis, which runs horizontally. Now this isn't quite far enough, so I'm going to move it just a little bit more. So now our player sprite is in the right spot. If we wanted it to start higher up or lower down, we'd adjust the y-axis. Now I'm going to set up the opponent's paddle. We're going to need a new sprite for this, so I'm going to hover over the new sprite button, and I'm going to choose upload sprite. And I'm going to choose pong paddle again. Sometimes the new sprite randomizes where it appears, so we're going to make sure it's at x0 and y0 before continuing and I'm going to rename this Sprite Opponent Paddle. Since our player sprite was at x negative 210, our opponent sprite is going to be at x positive 210. Oops. And next, we're going to need our ball. So I'm going to need another sprite again. So hover over the sprite button, and then I'm going to upload, and I'm going to use the graphic Pong Ball. And again, make sure that it's centered at X0 and Y0. 
and I'm going to rename it ball. And finally, we're going to need sprites that function as goals for the ball to hit. This is basically a hitbox that the ball will need to touch in order to score a goal on either side. So I'm going to upload a new sprite called Pong Goal. Okay, so apparently you guys will be getting the file shortly. So I'll continue my lecture for now. So now I'm going to zero out the X and the Y axis for the Pong goal. And I'm going to name this one Player Goal. It should be behind the player paddle so that they have something to protect. So I'm going to change the X value to negative 230. This way, if the ball hits anything behind the player paddle, it'll recognize that you've won. I chose the red color only because it helps you see where the goal goes better. When you make your own graphics tomorrow, you can be more creative. So now I'm going to upload yet another sprite. Pong goal. Zero it out. And I'm going to name this one opponent goal. We're going to do the same as the player goal, but on the opposite end. So the X value will be positive 230. It's not the Y, 230. So now our playing field is set up and we have the sprites we need to begin our coding with. So now that we have a ball sprite to work with, let's tell the computer how to make it move. So with the ball sprite selected and the window in code mode, let's start adding some code. We're going to want to start by going to the events menu. We want the ball to start moving when we start the game. So we choose the green flag puzzle piece again. When we click the green flag, the game will start. And the first thing we want the ball to do is recenter at the middle of the screen. We always want to start the game with the ball in the middle of the screen. So we're going to go into motion and we're going to choose go to x0, y0. This way it'll always start at the middle of the screen. We want the ball to start moving and keep moving. So we're going to have to introduce a loop. So the infinite loop will allow the computer to execute its code in a loop repeatedly. And in this case, we want the computer to continually move the ball. So under control, I'm going to put in a forever loop. All of the code within this loop will be executed over and over again. We want the ball to move constantly, so under motion, we're going to tell the ball to move steps. And I'm going to change it to 8.5. So steps are pre-programmed into Scratch to move a character forward, and changing this number will change the speed for the ball. So now let's test this.
Our ball moves constantly in one direction, but it has no angle. So now, under motion, I'm going to get it to point in direction. We want the ball to move in a random direction every time, but there's no option for that here, only to choose one direction. And again, the direction can be shown here. So I'm going to put point in direction when the game starts, because I only want it to choose its direction once. If I put it in the forever loop, the ball will constantly change its direction, so it'll wiggle instead of going in one direction. However, there's a round circle here, so we can fill it with another round circle. So under operators, I'm going to choose pick random, and I'm going to put it into the gap. So there's 360 degrees in a circle, and we want the ball to go in literally any direction except up and down and to the player paddle. So we're going to change the degrees to 15 and 165. The reason I chose these numbers is that the ball will always go towards the enemy paddle. I'll do it a few times to show that the ball now goes in a random direction from, from 15 to 165 degrees. So now you'll see it starts in a random direction every time. Now the ball is moving, but you'll notice that it gets stuck on the screen. So Scratch automatically creates a barrier along the edges of the screen for us, but it doesn't know that we want the ball to bounce yet. So the next thing we're going to do is go into motion and find if on edge bounce. So we need Scratch to constantly check to see if the ball is touching the wall or not. So we're going to put it inside of our forever loop. If it wasn't in our loop, the computer would check once and that's it. It wouldn't end up bouncing because when the game starts, it's not touching anything. So now if we check it, the ball bounces properly. However, the ball can touch the paddle and nothing happens. So now we're going to need some if statements. So the if statement is when the computer checks if something has happened, and if it has, it executes the code. If the conditions are not met, it does not execute the code. We only want the score to go up if the ball hits the paddle. So we'll need to use an if statement. So we'll find it under control. And we're going to need two if statements. One for if it hits the player paddle, and one for if it hits the opponent paddle. We're going to need this to happen in the infinite loop because we need to constantly check to see if the ball has hit the paddle yet. And now we're going to need to go into the sensing menu. So we want it to check to see if it's touching the player paddle or the opponent paddle. So I'm going to drag these in here. And now we have to tell the computer what we want to happen if the ball touches one of the paddles. We want it to bounce in a random direction away from the paddle. So again, we'll go into motion and choose point and direction for both. To get the random direction selection, we'll go again into our operators tab and choose pick random.
In this case, we always want the ball to bounce away from the current pedal that it's hitting at a random angle. So if the player touches it, we want it to move in a positive X direction. And if the opponent touches it, we want it to move in a negative X direction. So the angles I've chosen for these are 10 and 170 for the player paddle and negative 10 and negative 170 for the opponent paddle. And again, this is the direction. 10 to 170 looks like this, so it can bounce off in any of these directions if it hits the player paddle. And for the enemy paddle, it can bounce off in any one of these directions. This will ensure that it can bounce away at an angle that isn't too steep so that it doesn't keep going up and down. So I'm going to test this. And now once the ball hits the paddles, it now bounces away from the paddle that it hits. We also want to keep track of the y-axis of the ball for later. And the y-axis is up and down. So under variables, we're going to create a new variable. So I'm going to click make a variable and I'm going to name it ball y for all sprites. So a variable is like a container for data that can either stay the same or be constantly updated. In this case, we wanted to keep track of what the current y axis of the ball is. So I'm going to name it the ball y for the sprites. And with the ball sprite still selected, we are going to set ball y to zero under variables, and we're going to put it directly at the top of the forever loop. This way, ball y is constantly being updated. However, we want ball y to track the y position of the ball. So we're going to need to fill in the blank with the y position from the motion menu. So now it's constantly checking the y position of the ball, and then it's storing it under ball y. We'll need this for our opponent paddle, which I'll get to later. The opponent paddle is going to need to know where the ball's y position is in order to try to stop it. You'll notice that the ball y variable is at the top of the screen, and it's constantly keeping track of where the ball's y value is. And I don't want this to show up while I'm playing my game. So under variables, I'm going to find hide variable ball y. And I'm going to put this when the game is started so that when the game starts, it doesn't show and it doesn't clutter our screen. So now our ball is moving properly. The paddles don't move though. So poor, currently this is a pretty boring little game. So let's make it so you can move the player paddle. So ch to change the code for the player paddle, we're going to click its sprite. And now that I've selected the player paddle sprite, we want to be able to move the paddle up and down using the mouse. So first I'll go into events and I'll make sure that this code starts once you start the game. We always want the paddle to follow our mouse so that we can control it using our mouse. So under control, we're going to use a forever loop again. We also want to constrain the movement to the Y axis, which is vertical only. We don't want the paddle moving left and right or anywhere else on the screen, only up and down. So only motion, we're going to find the puzzle piece that changes the y-axis. Set y to zero. So right now it doesn't have an option for the mouse and it only sets to zero, which means it'll stay on the middle of the screen vertically. So we're going to look under sensing and we're going to find mouse y. 
it will immediately find out where your mouse is on the y-axis and it'll change the paddle's y-axis to match where your mouse is so that the paddle will follow your mouse as you move it up and down. So now if we test our game, we can move our paddle using our mouse. So what's happening here is that mouse Y keeps track of the Y axis of where your mouse is and we're matching the paddle's Y up to match that of your, of your mouse. So when you move your mouse up and down, the paddle moves as well. And unfortunately, we do have a small problem here and that's that our paddle moves beyond the screen. Before we do that though, we need to make sure that this paddle always starts at the right spot on the screen when we begin the game. So under motion, we're going to find go to X and find the original location that we put it at, which was X minus 10, 210. and that should reset our paddle's position every time we play, otherwise it'll start where we left it last. And so now we have to fix the paddle problem of our paddle going off the screen. So under motion, we're going to find set y, oh, we're going to find if on edge bounce, so that it doesn't go beyond the screen limits. So when the computer does if on edge bounce, there is a bug. So when the player ch moves it, it changes its angle when it bounces on the screen. And I don't want that, so I'm going to fix it. So to fix this, we'll add for motion, point in direction 90, and I'm going to put that directly under if on edge bounce. This will make sure that it forces the paddle to be at the angle that I always want it to be. So now the computer will automatically realign the paddle direction to always be pointing upwards after a bounce. Now the opponent paddle needs to be able to move on its own. So we're gonna use the most basic form of artificial intelligence for this. Artificial intelligence is the computer making decisions based on coded rules. It can't think like a human being. It can only follow the rules that you give it. So we're gonna give it some basic AI. We want the opponent to try and block the goal, the ball from hitting its goal. One way to look at this is, if the ball is higher than the paddle, the paddle will want to move up on the Y axis. And if the ball is lower than the paddle, the paddle will want to move down on the Y axis. So let's start by clicking on the opponent paddle sprite. We'll start again in advance with the green flag clicked. And we want the enemy paddle to always reset to its original place. So we're going to grab a motion piece. And this is where we want it to start at the beginning of the game. This is where I put it. And now we're going to need another forever loop in control. So we want the opponent paddle to move towards the ball. So in motion, I'm going to find glide. So this is an interesting part. What we want the opponent paddle to do is to find the X position, which should always stay the same because we don't want it to be able to move left and right and keep it. We also want it to try and move towards the ball and this is where the variable we created comes in. The variable is keeping constant track of the ball's Y position, so we want the opponent's paddle to glide towards that ball's Y position. So under motion, we can find the X position and drag that in. And this generally won't change because we don't want it to move left and right. And now we're going to want to use our ball Y variable. 
So now what we're telling it is that we want it to glide one second to the X position, which always stays the same. It doesn't move left and right. And we want it to follow the ball by variable, which is being tracked. So wherever the ball is, it's gonna to start to want to move towards that in one second. So let's test this. You'll notice that there's a lag and that our opponent paddle is way too slow. That's because it takes one second for it to glide to the current Y spot that the ball is in. I need to shorten its response time, but not too much or it'll be unbeatable. So I'm going to change this so that it glides 0.2 seconds to X. And now I'm going to test this again. So in order to give the player some ability to win the game, it needs a small lag in getting to the ball. You can adjust this amount to change the difficulty of the game. If the paddle is hitting the ball every time, it's too impossible to beat and it's not fun. If it hits it most of the time, it's hard. If it hits it sometimes, it's easy. And if it never hits the ball, there's no challenge. Part of designing games is adjusting difficulty so that it's playable but still fun, and everyone likes a different amount of challenge. That's why we have different modes for games, like easy and hard. It's about making the, gun, the game fun for the player. Some people like hard games, and some people like easy. Another thing to keep in mind is that not everyone has the same reflexes, and the difficulty of hard for one person might be impossible for another, and that's not fun. So get lots of other people to test your game to get an idea of what hard and easy actually is, because everyone's different, and just because you're able to do it, and you're, or you're not able to do it, doesn't mean someone else won't be able to be. So anyways, back to working on our opponent. So we have the same problem with the enemy paddle that we had with the player paddle. It goes beyond the borders of our screen. So beneath this, I'm gonna go back into motion. I'm going to add if on edge bounce. And then again, point in direction 90 so that it doesn't bend at the corners. So let's test this again. and now it works properly. Okay, so now we have the basic movement working and we just need to make the goals work, get the score working and create a win or lose state for the game. So we're gonna create two new variables to store our player and our opponent score. So under variables, I'm gonna create player score and opponent score. These variables will hold how many points we have. And you'll notice that they appear at the top of the game screen. Because the ball hitting the goal is the deciding factor in whether the score goes up, we're going to click on the ball sprite to add some more code. So under variables, Let's find set ball y. And we're going to grab two of these. And we're going to change this to the player score and the opponent score so that every time you start the game, they start at zero. And we're going to want that to start when we first start the game. Now hitting a goal is supposed to add one to the score and then reset the stage. So now we have to have the computer check to see if it's hitting a goal and tell it to add one to the score on the side that it hits. For this, we'll need two more if statements under control. And I'll be placing them still in the, the loop, but under the other if statements. And we want to sense to see if the ball is touching the player goal first. So under sensing, we're going to choose touching mouse pointer. And we're going to change these to player goal and opponent goal. So now if the ball touches one of these, we'll tell it what to do. So now we want to update the goal number. So under variables, drag in 
change ball to Y. And we're going to want to change this to opponent score and player score. So if we touch the player's goal, we want the opponent's score to go up by one. And if we touch the opponent's goal, we want the player's score to go up by one. So I'm going to test this. And you'll notice that it went up quite a bit and it should not be doing that. So the ball is touching the goal for a small amount of time, but it counts multiple scores when it's in the spot and it doesn't reset to the beginning when a goal is scored. So we're going to fix this. So under motion, we're going to go to x0, y0. Change these to zero. And we're going to put them under the opponent score so that Every time we score, the ball goes right to the middle of the screen again. But you'll notice that when we play it, there's absolutely no lag time. And we don't want the ball to immediately start moving again because we need the player to recognize that the ball has moved. Otherwise, they might be confused that the ball has moved and be not be able to react quickly enough. So I'm going to go into control and I'm going to choose wait one second. Now when a goal is scored, it'll wait, and then it'll start again. This gives the player a little bit of time to regroup before playing another round. After this, we're going to copy the block, point in direction, and pick random from the top of the ball's code, and insert them after the wait one second. So I am just going to copy this and you can copy it using control C, control V. And the reason I'm putting these here is because the ball will not, is because our code at the very top um, it only plays when the game first starts, and we need it to do it during the game as well. So I'm just going to copy these values. Otherwise, it would just go straight like it originally did. So I'm going to test this again. And now the ball is randomizing again after a reset. So now our score system works, but we don't have a way for the player to win. It goes on counting forever, or at least until the variable hits its limit. So every variable has a maximum amount that it can count up to, and sometimes we can get bugs or problems if we try to go beyond the maximum amount. It can either look like the game crashing or unexpected behavior occurring. An example of this is like in the game Civilization, where Gandhi suddenly becomes murderous because the programmers forgot to tell the game what to do if the variable goes below zero. His variable went below the minimum amount and flipped over to the maximum amount of aggression. In this case, I haven't tested it, but I'm guessing Scratch would either eventually give you a negative score or it would crash if your, if your score went too high. So we're going to try and avoid this, and we're going to tell the computer what to do when we reach the points amount that we want, which is 11. So under the ball sprite, we're going to add two more if statements. And again, I want this to be in our forever code. So under operators, we're going to want an equals operator. Find the equals operator. Here it is. And what we're going to do is we're going to drag in the variables player score and opponent score. Mm -hmm. 
So it's going to check to see what's stored inside our variable in which one is being added to every time it hits the goal. And once one of the scores hits 11, we're either going to have the player either win or lose the game. So just to make this easy, we're going to have a little pop-up that appears when you win or lose the game to let you know if it worked. So under looks, I'm going to grab this little talking thing here. And I'm going to have it say, you win for three seconds, or you lose for three seconds. So if our player score reaches the 11, the game should say, you win. And if the opponent's score equals 11, it, the game should say, you lose. It's pretty simple, and usually the game will just switch to an end screen or something. But to just keep some things simple, I'm just going to have the ball tell you whether or not you win or lose. And after that, we want the game to quit and stop running. So under control, I'm going to choose stop all. And what this does is it ends the game by stopping all the scripts and everything that's running. So I'm going to test this. and we have a working game. So we're going to quickly add a little bit of polish before we finish up. So now to make the game a little more interesting, we're going to add some music and sound. So for today, we're going to add some temporary music and sound. And in a few days, I'll teach you how to record your own or how to choose your own and add them into the game. So for now, I want the ball to make a sound when it touches the paddle. So I'm going to make sure I'm on the ball sprite and I'm going to go into the Sounds tab. So here I'm going to add the, click the Add Sound button, and I'm going to found, find the sounds that I want to, uh, the game to make. So I have chosen these sounds beforehand. I want Crunch. Oops, where is it? Disconnect. Win. And lose. Feel free to use whatever sounds you like. We'll be replacing them eventually with your own. So back in the code tab, go into sound and find start sound. The reason we're choosing this sound over play crunch until done is because the game will pause until it's completed playing the sound. This way, this, it plays the sound and it keeps going. So I'm going to want it to play the sound crunch, duplicate it, and I want it to make this sound every time it touches the player paddle. And also every time it touches the opponent paddle. And I want the sound disconnect to play every time the ball hits a goal. Disconnect. Disconnect. So I'll find the goals. So if it touches the goal, it will play the sound. And if it touches this goal, it'll play the sound. And under my win conditions, I want to put my win and lose sounds. So again, I'm going to choose sounds, win and lose. So if the player gets all 11, it's going to play the sound win. And if the player or if the opponent gets 11, then it's going to play the sound lose. And then finally, I want some background music playing while my game plays. So I'm going to click under my stage backdrops and I'm going to go into the sounds menu. So I'm going to click choose a sound. 
and under loops, I'm going to find some music. And I am going to choose Dance Energetic for my game. So once I've selected the music, I'm going to go into the Code tab. And then adding from sound, play, play sound Dance Energetic until done. However, this will only make it play once until it's finished playing. So if I put it inside an infinite loop, it will play through the entire song once and then it'll repeat it, so it'll play forever. So now if I test my game, I have music playing in my background. So now we have a completed game of Pong. And we have one the last thing to test, and that's the win and lose function. So to make this faster, I'm going to change the requirements to be one for each. They both work, so Pong is done. Your job this week is to complete a finished game of Pong, and if you want to challenge yourself a little, tomorrow we're going to try changing the graphics. Uh, we're going to on Thursday we're going to add different sounds and music. Um, things you can do to challenge yourself this week: you could try and change the rules of the game, anything you want to make it interesting. You could even have a title screen, a win screen, a lose screen if you have the time. So tomorrow we're going to learn about how to create custom graphics for our game, and the day after we're going to go over how to select sounds in our game. This video will be up for reference, and I'll be available on Discord for questions. If you have any questions or need clarification on something, or you get stuck and need my help, you can message me during my office hours this week. Good luck, and have fun making your first game of Pong.